<laughs> I want to thank you for joining me today. Boy, I'd love to say you're in for a treat, but today I'm telling you, it's a challenging Bible lesson as we look at the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the season of Lent. We know it's an artificial season, a, si a time that we put aside in order to prepare ourselves for the joy and the celebration of that wonderful season of Easter. Because honestly, we know that we already live in the resurrection. So this season of Lent is just a reminder to us of the great price that you paid, that you would rather die for us than live without us. And for that, we give thanks. Open up the scripture for us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I'm going to read the lesson for today, and I'm not going to lie. Just be prepared there's going to be a cluster bomb that's going to blow off right in front of you as we read this lesson today. Because if you understand the lesson that I'm reading to you today, you're either a better person than me or you're a liar. One of the two. Because this lesson is an absolute mess. So we take a look at 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, the baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal for God, for good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone to heaven after the angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Like I said, if you got all of that, I know I was reading it a little bit quickly, and that's kind of intentional to kind of demonstrate to you how crazy this lesson is. You have to understand, this is written by a guy by the name of Peter, that's right, the rock, Cephas, and I will tell you what, Greek was his second language, if not his third language. And um, he runs just like uh, these run-on sentences in the same way that Paul does. It was kind of a very common thing. And, you know, in Greek you can kind of get away with that to one extent because you'll have uh, phrases and you break things down in phrases. You have to see how they relate. But that's part of the problem in interpretation. Remember, every translation of the Bible is an interpretation. You're taking this phrase and trying to correspond it to this phrase. But there's debate. Does this phrase really correspond to this phrase? Or is it corresponding to that phrase? There are a lot of debates about these things. Because we don't know, and especially when you get a guy like Peter, who is not a Greek scholar, and certainly Greek is, again, his second or third language, it becomes really confusing. So when you think about Peter, let's just think about Peter real quick, okay? Peter spoke a language called Aramaic. You're saying, wait a minute, I thought he was a, I thought he was a Jew. Didn't they, don't you speak Hebrew? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Actually not. If you know a Jew today and they speak modern Hebrew, that is not the same thing as classical Hebrew and certainly is not the same thing as biblical Hebrew. But he spoke a thing called Aramaic. Aramaic was a different language. It was a Semitic language, but it is not Hebrew. Um, Aramaic is probably a good 600 years older than Hebrew. And it was spoken by the Babylonians. Remember, the Jews became captive in Babylon, and there they learned Aramaic. Now, Aramaic and Hebrew are related languages, as I said, because they're Semitic languages. However, that's like saying that, oh, I don't know, French and Spanish are both romantic languages. And yes, you can actually pick up on some of the same structures, some of the similar words between French and Spanish, but they're not the same language. If you want to understand Spanish and you've taken French, you're going to have to take Spanish. Okay? So, they're related languages. There's a similarity to, between Aramaic and Hebrew, but they are not the same. Okay? So he spoke Aramaic because, again, the Jews started speaking Aramaic after they went into captivity in Babylon. Once they brought back, of course, then the Jews got defeated by the Greeks. So they started speaking Greek as well. So it was very common for people to speak Aramaic, but also know some Greek. It's kind of like going to Germany, and you run into a lot of people who can speak English. 
Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, same way, Greek was kind of a secondary language, and it was a universal language which many people spoke. Didn't mean that they could write it. I don't think you could ask a, a German uh, person who speaks German from Germany who also speaks English. I don't know that you could ask him to write a dissertation in English. That would be a challenging thing. But that's basically what Peter's trying to do. It's difficult for him. Oh, but this is not just any ordinary Greek. This is what we call Koine Greek, which Koine Greek is, is, um, is how can I say, it, it's a uh, popular version of Greek. You had classical Greek and you had Hellenistic Greek and, you know, you, are they, uh, not Hellenistic Greek, I'm sorry, you had uh, classical Greek and you had several varieties of Greek all the way up to Koine Greek. Koine Greek was something that was spoken by common people and it combined Greek and it combined it with other languages and so it's a little bit different than classical Greek. It's just the common person's Greek. But this is the type of Greek that we have in the Bible. Now, um, oh, apologize, I got my eraser here. So here he was writing in Greek, certainly not his primary language, and he gives us this cluster bomb of a passage, which is basically one sentence. Did you hear me read this? One sentence. What would have happened to you if you'd written a, a sentence like this in your English class? You probably would have gotten then, oh, I don't know, F! Are you kidding me? This is just crazy. This, uh, this verse. So what we have to do is break it apart phrase by phrase and try to figure out what phrase goes with what phrase and what phrase is modifying what phrase. I've kind of done this up here. I know you probably can't see it. You know what? I, I, I'm sorry. If you're watching this on a phone today, I apologize. You won't be able to see it, but you're welcome to download my paper in which I've kind of highlighted the things that I'm talking about today. And basically what I've done is I've put the sentence in a structure where you know what phrase modifies what word. So hopefully we can not get lost. All right? So if you take a look at this, this is his very first premise. For Christ suffered for sins once and for all time, for the just and for the unjust. Oh, that is really good news. That means whether you're a sinner or not, which, by the way, we are all sinners, whether you think of your, uh, yourself as a good person or not, Jesus Christ has come to you and for you. For while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. This is the best news. If we stop right there, that's a great lesson in of itself. I want to tell you that nobody else in this world has got a claim on you except for Jesus. And he's going to win someday. He is going to win you over. So I no longer necessarily talk about non-Christians. I talk about pre-Christians, people who have yet to be won over by the love of Jesus Christ. Who couldn't be when ultimately it's presented to them properly? Now, I sometimes don't always present Jesus Christ in the right way. I fail, and maybe some other Christians do, and so people can be turned off from Christianity for one reason or another. But Jesus is absolutely relentless. That's the good news. He's died for us all. I know that sounds very universalistic. Well, deal with it. Take it up with God. God's a universalist. God loves everybody and has given himself for everybody. Even those who don't make the cut. None of us make the cut. Okay? So he suffered for us. Now notice, I know if you can't see it, and again, you're watching on your phone, you better be you could better watch on your iPad. Maybe you can blow this up or you know pause it and blow it up. Or or if you're watching on your TV, good for you. You could probably even see this. He suffered. So this next phrase develops that word suffer. For Christ suffered. Why? Why did he suffer? So that he might bring us to God. This is why Jesus died. This is why often you'll hear me say this phrase. Jesus, God would rather die for us than live without us. Now, I didn't coin that phrase. I heard that from a man named Brennan Manning. He was just a wonderful author, and I'm not going to go into who he is. You've heard me mention him before, but he would always use that phrase. God would rather die for you than live without you. So that's what it is. He suffered so that he might bring us to God, having 
He suffered, having been put to death in the flesh. Now, that's actually an argument, and you don't get this. It's an argument against those people who believe that Jesus was just a spiritual being and didn't really suffer death because, after all, God and flesh don't mix. It's dumb. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a belief called docetism. It was an early heresy in the church where people believed that Jesus was just a, not a fleshly being. He wasn't a human being, not really. He was just God and or a spirit of some sort. But uh, Jesus combines these two. He is both God and human being. So, having been put to death in the flesh, so he really is dead. He suffered and he died. No, wait a minute. Now he's going to develop this word flesh. So he suffered... In the flesh, but he's made alive in the spirit. Now, this seems like a do docetism again, but this word spirit really refers to life. Okay? Pneuma, spirit, the breath that's in our lungs. It's what God breathes into us when we are created. The breath of life that comes from God. So, again, it's an argument about who Jesus is. He's made alive in the spirit. Okay? He made alive in the spirit. Now, this next phrase develops a word spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. So now, once he's killed, this is where oftentimes we get this idea that those prior to the resurrection were kind of in this limbo place. You know, it, it's not unprecedented that the uh, Roman Catholics have this idea um, that after you die, you go into a place of testing and preparation for the kingdom of heaven. There's nothing like that in the scripture, except for this reference right here, which seems to give us this impression, you know, Abraham's bosom, maybe you've heard of that, that people before Jesus Christ went to a kindly, goodly place. However, it wasn't in the kingdom of heaven. They didn't receive the fullness of that until Jesus Christ. So we get this impression that Jesus then came and, and ministered to all those spirits who are awaiting the salvation of God. Oh, and guess what God does? Remember again this? He suffered once in all time for the just and for the unjust. So he went to the just and the unjust, and they heard the love of God, and they were transformed, and they had a place in the kingdom. All right, so he's made alive in the spirit, Proclamation uh, in which he was also made and uh, went and made proclamation to the spirits. The spirits, which spirits, okay? This next phrase develops which spirits he's talking about. Who were once disobedient. So they were once time disobedient. When they walked on this earth, they did some really bad things. But that doesn't separate them from God. Not even the bad things that we do separate us from God's love. So the spirits who were once disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. Okay, now, you notice this is where it gets confusing. So the spirits who were once disobedient, when the patience of God kept them waiting. What, what time is he talking about? So this next phrase develops the patience of God. He was patient and the days of Noah with people because they were disobedient. Oh, now he's going to develop who those people were at the time of Noah during the construction of the ark. So he's defining when that day of Noah was. Oh, now he's going to define the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So eight people were brought through the water of a flood, but God saved everyone even those who died in the flood, because that's the type of God we have. So they were brought through the water. Okay, so that's the first phrase. Now take a look at this water. I've got an arrow that connects us all the way back to here, to verse 21. Because now he's going to use this word water and connect it with a new thought he has. It's a segue to a brand new thought. So, again, he brought the, he, Noah and his family safe through the water. He went and ministered to the people who were lost in the water of the flood and saved them, regardless, after the time of the flood. Oh, but this water, God wants to do this for you. Corresponding to that baptism, water, baptism, baptism, water. Do you see the connection that Peter makes here? Corresponding to that baptism, it now saves you. Oh, 
Let me be very clear about this water. The water of baptism is not the baptism of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, okay, John the Baptist did a baptism. This is John the Bees, John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance. with the hope that God will forgive. Um, the Baptist Church still uses the baptism of John. It's a baptism of repentance and hopes that people will be saved by God. Jesus replaces the baptism of John the Baptist. Jesus' baptism... is a claim on your life in the same way that circumcision was the claim of God's people in the Old Testament that these were my people they didn't earn it it took place before they were of a time of knowledge they were circumcised but the great thing about baptism of Jesus it applies not just to men it's a gift also to women to everybody it is the claim of God upon your life. You are my child. Hands off. Okay? Hands off, Satan. These are my people. So here's what Jesus is doing. Here's what Peter is doing. Pardon me. Tell us about Jesus. So that water, the baptism, which now saves you. Jesus is claiming you. Our repentance doesn't save us. Jesus' claim on our life saves us. Get this straight. Oh, I repented. I prayed the sinner's prayer. Good for you. Didn't save you. Jesus saves you. Okay? Not your prayer. Not your fervent attitude about your relationship with God. Jesus saves you. All his power, you contribute zero. Okay, do you get this? 100% Jesus does for your salvation. You do nothing. Repentance is a response to what Jesus has done for you. So, of course, when you know, baptism, the claim of God that now saves you, that, by the way, is, so remember, he, now he's going to develop this phrase, baptism. It's not the removal of dirt from flesh. See, this is kind of how a lot of churches talk about baptism. I'm just getting clean. I'm washing the dirt off of me. No, that's not what baptism is. What is baptism? Baptism is not just a removal of dirt from our bodies. It's an appeal to God for good conscience. Okay? It's an appeal. Well, who's doing the appealing? Jesus is on your behalf. Appealing that you would be set free from guilt, from angst, from bondage. So Jesus is like a lawyer who comes to God and appeals on our behalf and says to the judge, yeah, I know this guy, he's slime, he's dirt, he's done a lot of bad things. Please forgive him and set him free. <laughs> so baptism saves us, not as a removal of dirt, but as an appeal to God by Jesus for our good conscience. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That thing is set free because of what Jesus Christ has done. Again, nothing about you. Now we're going to develop Jesus Christ. Who is at the right hand of God? So now we know that Jesus, the one in whom we are celebrating, has the power to set us free. Because where is he? He's at the right hand of God. How did he get from the right hand to the right hand of God? Having gone into heaven after the angels and powers had been subjected to him. All things are now subjected to him. So Jesus has the ability to do what? suffer sin on our behalf and set us free. <laughs> I love it. 
I hope this is a blessing to you today. It is such a complex message. This is part of the problem when we get into reading the Bible. Remember, the Bible is the Word of God. It was written through human beings like Peter, who had horrible Greek and really confusing Greek. And so we have to pick through these things and work through these things. But this is a powerful message. In summary, it's very simple. Jesus Christ loves you so much that he would rather die for you than live without you. And he's got the power to make that happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that Jesus Christ has the power to set us free because of what he did for us on the cross. So we don't depend upon our goodness. We don't depend upon our confession of you. We don't depend upon our repentance. None of those things are going to save us. It's a gift of God through Jesus Christ. And so we give thanks to the one who would rather die than live without us. For it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you and send you forth in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.